So good morning to everybody. Welcome to the new breed of business. <clears throat> Today we are talking about inflation again, and we're talking, this is sort of our part two. Last week was the intro. If you took a look back at the post, there's a lot of good uh, reference material in there. But today we're going to get more into the solution of things like when inflation comes, what do we do? Um, I sent out an email that had a few examples of uh, alternative currencies, things that people are already doing. And it's on the, if we use our imagination, we can <clears throat> see that there are ways to address this and we don't have to just be beholden to the Federal Reserve. Uh, notes or currency, because as long as we're in community together with one another, especially Christian community, people create value, the land produces value and stores value. And in those things, even if we have dynamics going on around us, we have what we need. In other words, the Lord is our portion and we have what we need. And so it's, it's about getting our minds around that and then also talking about implementation steps. This is part of what I refer to sometimes as the storehouse strategy. We're having a gathering uh, in person to talk more about the storehouse uh, alternative banking strategy in Lindale, Texas at the JAMA Global Campus. Chris is here with us this morning and they are hosting. It's going to be a great conversation. It's June 4th and 5th. And if you can come, please join us. Everyone here is welcome. Um, but at that, uh, at that time, we're gonna be talking about what people are already doing and implementing along these lines and then how to network that together. And so some of what we're gonna discuss today is a little bit of a preview around that. So we start off with the premise, inflation is a threat and inflation is real because we've increased our money supply so dramatically in this last pandemic crisis um, and we have been doing that as a response to downturns um, the great what's referred to as the great recession the financial crisis we started introducing the idea of monetizing the debt in the united states monetizing the debt is a quick way of thinking about it is printing money it's electronic when it's done because it's going to be it's done today and bank balances but it's the same thing as like okay let's just print more money and then we'll utilize that as a tool to get people to uh, stimulate people to uh, increase economy and of course the risk is when you do that that your your currency becomes devalued or debased so the the little bit of the magic trick has been we have not had that in the past, uh, let's say 15, 20 years or a little bit further, and we've gotten away with it. But is that going to continue? And there's many things that you could delve into like in the economic wonkiness of it all, but uh, it's simply to say currently the Federal Reserve is committed to a above 2% inflation rate target. This is new, this is a change. And also the money supply is greatly expanding. I put in the notes that the M1 and M2 money supply, which has been our measure of money for a long time uh, in different forms earlier than the 70s, but in the current form, roughly around the 70s. And the Fed is abandoning measuring the money supply. So M1 and M2 are no longer counted. They're no longer reported. And that's that, that to me is a sign and, and a concern. Now, we don't have to create a conspiracy out of that. I think it's just, it's problematic that the Fed is no longer, and they've said this, they've said we're not focused on the supply of money any longer as a tool in our toolbox to help the economy going. Uh, also in the email, I put some videos from Ray Dalio who explains his theory of things. Ray Dalio is based here in Westport. Uh, he is not a Christian. He is a uh, New Age meditator, um, but he's an astute observer. And what he's basically seeing now is we're in this long dated cycle where the monetary system no longer 
has much of an effect when we stimulate it through additional growth. So what he's saying is it's kind of like when you use a drug and it works, let's say it's an antibiotic or any kind of drug, it works very potently at first, but then every time you use it again and again, it's less and less effective. So we are in the long part of this cycle, or if you think as I do that, that this is actually greater than a cycle event, this is actually a change, this is a shift now historically. Um, <clears throat> either way, you're seeing that if we pump in tons of money into the system, it's not having the, the normal effect of increasing the economy as much as it used to. And so therefore they've kind of tied it back into the money supply. Like, don't look at the money supply. It's irrelevant now. The money, it's also called the modern monetary theory, which is like, we can print money with relative impunity. Inflation won't go up that high uh, because of the global economic expansion, which by the way, has changed now because of protectionist measure. So the sort of 20, 25 years of the gates are wide open, everyone is trading with everyone, you can use the labor pools of the entire world and it's frictionless or relatively frictionless, Those that's changing. So a lot of this notion of our inflation will be subdued because China will make it cheaper, that's changing. Um, so that's, that's, that's big. And then we also have the issue of how long will the US dollar remain the world's reserve currency and settlement currency, that's changing. So a lot of things are changing. Um, it's good to know this and, and know the, the signs of these things, but our focus isn't on fear and panic of that. Although it is, as my dad was saying earlier, um, anyone who's older is concerned about inflation because all of your investment is what creates your income, especially bonds. And the issue we've got is that when inflation takes place, it's like a regressive tax. It actually hurts the poor more than anybody else. It makes, it's a little bit like a VAT tax, if you're familiar with that value added tax, where your staples of life become more expensive. Well, who does that hurt more? Bill and Melinda Gates? No, it hurts the people who are, you know, it caught, you know, their staples they buy at Walmart doubling is a really big problem because then all of a sudden they don't have money for any th other things. So that's, that's a little background on inflation and the risk of it. Now, the Fed would like to believe that this will not lead to inflation. They'd be able to corral it back in, but they're basically saying we might have a period of hyperinflation for a while as we come out of the pandemic. This is also new thinking. This hasn't happened before, but of course, they say, well, the pandemic hadn't happened before. So this is new too. And it, look, they could be right, but a lot of signs are giving people concern that, okay, what if they've missed it? And what if they, what if this inflation thing gets out of control and they cannot rein it in? The Fed uses tools that are very laggy in how it works. Like when they change interest <laughs> rates and they monetize things, it takes like months and months and months for it to come back through to the economy. Um, so that's the, that's the inflation side of things. It's like, okay, well, what do we do as believers in Christ? And should we just continue to use the world systems the way they are and hope for the best? Or is God saying, no, I have a plan to keep the kingdom growing. I have a plan to resource the church. I have a plan to resource things. Um, if you will press in and understand it. And that's, back to what are the solutions? How do we create things where in a given community, if I have a shovel that costs me $20 at the hardware store today, but it's going to cost me $100 next year because of inflation, and I have beans and corn and produce that I have today, and that's going to go up by four times next year as well, and so on and so forth. When you're based in a dollar that inflates, <clears throat> The problem is you, you run out of buying power and you cannot afford those things anymore. But if we start to look at, well, nothing changed in the basic equation of the good or of the food or of the service, when you're in a community together, you don't have to feel those effects of inflation if you're essentially, if you think about it, you want to think about it simply, you go to a barter system your shovel 
is worth what it's worth. Your food is worth what it's worth. And within the community, when you exchange with one another, you don't have to feel those effects because in theory, you could trade things that have relatively equal value. But if you're totally being supplied by a money system that's becoming worth less, then you're stuck because all the goods and services you want to buy just keep getting more and more expensive and you, you, you have no ability to react to that. That started happening a little bit in the 70s, but you know they could get to an extent where it's really bad, which is why I put in some of these write-ups like the history lessons of the Weimar Republic in Germany. At the end of the email, I have the wheelbarrows of money. They literally, to buy you know, a loaf of bread, you needed a wheelbarrow of money. Um, Zimbabwe, last write-up, included a $100 trillion note. Now that's ridiculous. That means their $100 trillion is worth nothing. Um, so those are hyperinflation examples. And again, we don't know, like, is the U.S. going to face hyperinflation? You know, people at the Fed would say, absolutely not. Nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. This would never happen. But we also know that kingdoms that are not uh, under God eventually collapse and all of the kingdoms of past have had these kind of troubles and if you know we don't turn back to god we will be just another history lesson of another failed currency of another uh trouble but if we're paying attention and we press in and say okay lord what, what do we do seeing this ahead we kind of kind of put our joseph hat on and say okay if God is saying we're going to have this trouble ahead like Egypt was faced or the whole world was faced back then, he has an answer. He has some wisdom. He has some ways of doing it. Um, and one of those ways that we're going to get into a little bit more now is if we have our own alternative banking system that's not directly dependent on the Federal Reserve as, say, Christian community network together across community to community, within that given community, you have the option, like the Berkshire uh, idea, Berkshires, which is a local currency, not to do with, deal with inflation hedging at all. It's just an idea of like, let's keep our economy local. Let's encourage people to trade with one another. And in doing that, they created an alternative. It's in parallel to the existing dollar system, and it's currently tied to the dollar, because I think it's like not, you get a value of like 90 cents on the dollar or something when you convert it. But you can start to see how in their community, they make it work. Like they encourage merchants and locals to use that currency. So that's an example where you can see it happening. Now you put one more step into that equation and you say, well, instead of having a fixed conversion rate to dollars, let's back that Berkshire type currency with other physical stored value. Right in the old days, we used to use gold, but you could use really anything of value to back an alternative currency, and then if you need to, you can decouple it from the U.S. dollar. And when you put these things together, you start to see, okay, wait a second. So you're saying that if we traded amongst ourselves and had a stable currency, we could go a long way in not being so affected by inflation. Now, this doesn't work, of course, if you keep all of your money in the markets. Like, it's not going to work if everything's in bonds and stocks and the Christian community stores all its, all its value there. So part of this exercise is having people realize, wait a second, maybe I need to take some of my value off of the table on the paper base side and put it into something that could be backed by something tangible, physical in my local community. And that's the premise of our discussion today, that like, how do we create such a thing? Is it possible? And how might it work? And what I'd encourage you to do is look at some of these examples and see how they work today and, and just imagine the possibilities of how it might work if we put together the concept of working with one another. This is not really a technology idea. It's not really a money idea per se. It's really a people idea. If you have people and you have land, the question is, do you need U.S. dollars? The Indians didn't need U.S. dollars, the Native Americans peoples, right? So do we need U.S. dollars or can we do it alternatively? 
or do we just have to be going down with the ship if the US dollar is under threat? And that's really the idea today is like, let's press in and ask God, what might this look like? So I'm gonna open up the floor now and welcome to Tom. Good to see you, brother. We played all the songs you gave me and you missed them. So no, I'm just teasing, but we can play them in the future. Um, yeah, so with that, let's talk. Let's talk about either part of the subject, which is what is really happening in our economic system with the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve notes, our US dollar, and what about the possibility of creating community banking that can decouple from the dollar if we design it and uh, put uh, enter into it in, in, in a way that would work. And so if anybody has any thought or that anybody has anything they wanna share, please go ahead. I'd like to share. I grew up in this kind of economy. I grew up in the Midwest in the middle of um, farmland and Amish communities and Lutheran and Mennonites and Amish working together. We had, we had, no one had very much cash, but we grew all kinds of things. And um, I, if I would describe the way our account, cash, their cashless economy worked, um, you would think that I grew up a hundred years ago and then you would think that I was really, really old. <laughs> well, we won't ask you for your age. So that's okay. But I really grew up that way and we never lacked for anything. I'll give you one example and then I will relinquish the floor. Um, we, we raised all kinds of animals and, and chickens and the, the um, feed companies very quickly realized that um, they could really get a market share if they would deliver their the uh, feed for the chickens in these beautifully flowered uh, um, bags, cloth, cotton bags. And sure enough, all the people, you, when the bags are empty, they turned those beautifully flowered bags into clothes for their kids. And I grew up in some of those clothes. So um, anyway, I, you guys would probably think that I'm lying. You probably think that I'm Show us some pictures, Lois. Come on. But pardon me. Show us some pictures. <laughs> All right. A few. Uh, anyway, I, I relinquish the floor because I'm not going to give away any more because you will not believe a word I say. No, I think you should keep going and just give us some more. Open our minds up to the possibilities of not having to depend so much on U.S. dollars or our money or our bank accounts digitally. Um, uh, I, think, I think some of the difficulties I see in that kind of communal system is we're still dependent unless we totally undependent ourselves on everything from you know, fuel for heating and yeah. driving our cars and flying airplanes, um, which is hard to decouple from the dollar. Um, and a lot of other products that fall into that same category. So, you know, and, and I really appreciate it. I think Lois, when you were growing up on a farm in the Midwest, you didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, flying on airplanes or, uh, you know, heating fuel if you were heating with, uh, you know, wood or whatever. Um, so it's, it's hard to decouple, isn't it? From, or just our needs for survival. This is a great question. I'm glad you asked it, Dad, because this is super important for people to realize. I think your concerns are well-founded. Like, Greg, isn't this like utopian life and we are zooming back 100 years ago? You can't put time back in a bottle. Um, sure, absolutely. But the idea is when you create this, just like the Berkshires example, it does not eliminate participation in the US dollar economy, what it does is it helps you preserve something separate from it that's valuable. And if the dollar appreciates, as long as you have a bridge back into the dollar based economy, you could still purchase the fuel or oil or anything else that you might need. But what you're not doing is putting all of your eggs in the dollar basket. So a quick way of understanding that is let's just take gold, right? So gold is a 
been long-term valuable um, uh, over centuries. So if you just imagine, instead of putting all, if you had, let's say you had a million dollars saved up for retirement, Instead of putting a million dollars into your retirement account, and then you use that for your income along with social security, which is dollar based. And, but the problem is that that million dollars may become worth a hundred thousand in a few years. And all of a sudden your buying power like goes away. So all of a sudden your fuel, your airplane ticket becomes unaffordable. Instead of $500, it's $5,000 to fly. Instead of a dollar of gasoline being $3, it's $12 or $50 or something like that. Problem is if you just leave it all in dollars because you say this is how you have to buy things, your ability in the future to do anything falls away greatly. Um, but the idea of what we're talking about is you still build a bridge. So you're not building something in isolation, some utopian, you know, we will just grow and churn our own butter. That's not the total idea, it's really, a, a hybrid of the two, just like the Berkshire example. Berkshire is a little different because it's tied to the dollar, but it doesn't have to be is the question. So as long as this stored value is separated, but you can convert it in a bridge, essentially you can buy what you need in whatever dollar it's based in. It could be the yuan, it could be the US dollar, it could be the euro, because whatever you've got, the idea in constructing it is you still have a bridge into something that's valuable. So how do you do that? If it's all in gold, you sell a little bit of gold, you buy some Euro to buy your oil, or you sell a little gold to buy your US dollars to buy some oil. Now, if the oil is instead of $50 a barrel, it's $1,000 a barrel. The idea is that your stored value was a better hedge of inflation than the US dollar. So you instead of having to spend $1,000 to get that oil, you only had to spend the gold equivalent, which would be far less. So if you're tracking with what we're discussing here, it's like creating an alternative banking together in a community, which has its local applicability. That may only be half of your economy, but at least it's some. The rest of what your economy is and needs, you still bridge into the old system. But the idea is that you're not totally dependent on it any longer. And if it collapses, you're not left holding the bag. You're left having already exercised your muscles and worked with another way of doing it amongst ourselves. And it doesn't just have to be local, right? Because local communities local Christian communities can tie together with other local Christian communities. And then you have a network of working together. And then the network can be stronger than the local expression. So then you'd say, oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, actually, people own oil wells and refineries in our network down in Texas. Let's buy some of our oil and refined products from them. And so you can start to see how it can be more expansive than just corn and, and butter. So I hope that addresses or partially addresses uh, what you're getting at, because I think it's a totally valid uh, concern. Do you think that, um, you know, this whole, I mean, my feeling is inflation is really going to start rising quite, you know, no matter what the Federal Reserve does, I think we're going to go from, you know, one and a half to four or five percent inflation. Uh, I see that over the next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, maybe 24 months, um, and that'll change things dramatically. Um, do you think that's a reason why even now large financial corporations and banks are really looking to cryptocurrency that we talked about the other week, whether that's Bitcoin or some of the others that are coming online, uh, thinking that they will be more protective against inflation? Great question. And I think that it's part of the reason that that trend is occurring, but the major reason it's occurring is simple. It's greed because people will see an asset class appreciate, but they missed out. And if you're managing an endowment or a foundation or institutional money, you're like, wait a second, you know, we, we're not making any money in the bonds. We're not making any money in these other investments. These guys are getting, a hundred, you know, hundred time returns 
we have to at least sprinkle a little of that pixie dust into our portfolio so we can participate mm. in it. Besides that, our customers are all demanding that we get them access to cryptocurrency because it's going to the moon. And I think that's more the driver behind that trend is people are getting on the bandwagon because there's money to be made. I, re- I, I think a lot of the theoretical ideas behind cryptocurrency are inflationary hedging and people are now talking about it being a replacement for gold and things like that. But the trouble is if the mania stops, it's not physically worth a thing. There's nothing behind it. There's no government. There's no ability to tax. There's nothing. There's just the idea of a thing, right? So what we're talking about in trying to back a community-based economy is not just another cryptocurrency as an alternative currency. It's like we could use those technologies, a, a crypto, a, sorry, a blockchain technology for record keeping. But if we want stability, which is what helps hedge uh, inflation, not crazy outsized returns that could collapse in a bubble, which is what cryptocurrency is right now. A lot of people say cryptocurrency isn't currency because it's wildly fluctuating. But if we have a pool backed by the resources of that community, including physical things that have value, but it can include anything. It can include grain. It can include water. It can include gold. It can include lands. It can include a lot of things that have physical value. Things that are physical don't go away in a crisis or a bubble or a tulip mania or anything like that. So I think that's that's another response to that great question, which is like, well, why not like just get all into crypto and we'll use that instead of the dollar. That's our perfect hedge. The problem is that those things could easily collapse. Well, and that's why investment people would balance that out by having you know, investments both in commodities as well as in cryptocurrency, as well as in, you know, regular stocks and bonds and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a balanced approach that all investors take. But if the fundamentals of the system, which is US dollar denominated and settled, are inherently weakening and inflating, that portfolio theory won't hold because portfolio theory is about uh, distributing things around, but not necessarily distributing them to physical only. It's what they're distributing is like anything that'll make us money. If commodities are going to go up, we're on that. If, if Bitcoin is going up, we want a piece of that. So that that idea of portfolio theory is to diversify your risk, which works. But the question is, will it work in a hyperinflationary environment for U.S. dollars? Because now you're trying to chase other assets that, oh, well, what what else could we buy? Oh, well, let's buy Chinese stocks that are in Riumbi. But what if those, uh, what if those uh, currencies also don't hold value? So you, you, you can start to see if we have a currency, if we have a central bank problem globally, I would contend that the diversification theory and portfolio, modern day portfolio theory, does not necessarily hedge anything. It, 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 the question some, is, will it work? Some, something to kind of add to that too, is that some of these like cryptocurrencies, um, they are expressions of like what we're talking about as kind of an ideal. So like some of these currencies, they are the currency that is used in like a nook of a market, right? So, you know, things like, like V chain, right? So like V chain is a, a cryptocurrency that's utilized in hospitals and medical supply distributors, right? So this is the currency that like these different companies use um, to interact with one another so that, and basically because the technology is really good at tracking um, like chain of supply. So if there's ever like some corruption in your chain of supply, you know how to track it, right? And so they've decided, oh, because it serves this purpose, we'll use this currency as how we do exchange with one another. And so I think conceptually, right, you have this, this market, right, this kind of like centralized market that is around, you know, the medical field um, and um, chain of supply, 
Um, and then you have a currency that's devised to like make that market more efficient. And so what, what I think is like a, an interesting concept is the idea not just of like, okay, like let's just start our own Bitcoin, but like that idea of, hey, you have a bartering system, you have a bartering market um, amongst believers or like amongst a certain space. And, you know, cause there, there's a reason money exists, right? Because bartering, ch trading chickens for shovels, um, it, it gets cumbersome, right? Um, so it's kind of this idea of you can have smaller markets, right? Smaller exchange markets um, that then create their own currency. Um, you, you, of course, just like with cryptocurrency or any other currency, you have the, um, or even countries with multiple, not countries, but regions with multiple currencies, you have the, the kind of the complexity of exchange where you have to exchange this for that and this for that for currencies. Um, but this notion of, you know, creating a smaller market and a currency that's used within it um, is not like, it's not that like far off. Um, but I think the idea, right, is how do we develop that market? How do we develop that, that space of interaction um, first, as opposed to trying to just like create the technology that would support it first? Right. And Joel, you're making a great point and thank you for making it, which is not all cryptocurrency is like Bitcoin, which is backed by nothing and is wildly changing in value. There's things like Stablecoin, Bitgold, uh, you mentioned VeChain, there's others that are based differently. Now, one of the troubles is that in the valuation world of all crypto together, and I saw this in an article the other day that just like shocked me, the total value of all cryptocurrency of all types that's available to the public is currently around $2 trillion, which is about the amount of US dollar greenbacks in circulation around the world. And I'm not talking about the electronic component, I'm talking about the printed money. So imagine that all of the dollars in the world uh, printed in circulation, I think is actually less than the value of cryptocurrency today. So, I mean, you, I look at that and I say, like, wow, that seems to me it's a little bit uh, getting ahead of itself. Um, but the idea of a thing, like you're saying, is totally valid. Like, whether it's Berkshires or VeChain or Bitgold or something like this, these are things that are we can look to as proof of concept. It may not be the answer, right? Let's just base it all around this or that but it gives you the idea and the um, demonstration that these things are possible. They work in parallel to our current economy, not in total isolation, um, that they can relate to uh, the community. It's like affinity based. So you mentioned medical field. So you can have affinity relationships. We're talking about Christian community, but in theory, this could be expanded to other types of community. Um, and, and so, yes, I think that's exactly right. Like, imagine if we use something that's already been demonstrated, uh, or develop something and we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just putting together the component parts built upon relationship in Christ. That's the key. Why are we different? Why is the kingdom different? Why are, why should Christian community be different? Because we have a set of relationships that's based eternally. We have a father who will always provide for us. So that's the strength of the economy, if you will, or if alternative banking system, if you will, not the tech or the this paper or that shovel. It's really more in the, hey, if we are trusting God, he can make a way, even if it's supernatural, combined with natural, he can make a way. And it really starts in those relationships as you say, instead of just the tech or the, or the banking process or what, you know, whatever else is developed for, for process. I think another um, consideration, and, and I remember this very clearly, when inflation got out of control in the 70s and the United States government imposed wage and price controls, uh, it really sort of screwed up the whole system. Um, and uh, that the government could certainly 
interfere again in that way easily. Right. Plus, the government required the all gold be confiscated at one point, which just seems crazy. Yeah, but yeah that was much earlier. Yeah, that was back but, in the Roosevelt. I mean, so these the government could intervene and not necessarily the best way. Lois, you wanted to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just address um, Peter's uh, for, for comment and also Joel and you. Um, just to give an example of the, the positive results of growing up in this kind of multi church, multi denominational community where people exchange services and things um, that enabled my parents to save enough money to put all four of their kids through college. And we, and we all graduated with no debt. And I often scratch my head, how was I able to save that much money? Um, and that you're describing, Greg, explains because they they only had to spend money on gas and you know other um, things that Peter mentioned. They didn't have to spend um, money on everything, so they were able to save that. So I just want to just give a positive report on the results for me. And we even had a the the, the Lutheran Mennonite. Um, Amish communities that all help each other. We had a Catholic doctor for the community. He belonged to the Catholic Church. Now that's true ecumenicalism. <laughs> so if we can get Catholics and Protestants together. Look up, look at the numbers we could get. Yeah. So we're not we're not advocating for. Um, let's get nostalgic, and we don't need medicine. We don't need this. We don't need that. I think what we're advocating for is like, let's not put all of our trust and eggs in the dollar basket. Let's uh, create the natural hedge of working together in community with one another. Even if like we have short-term disruptions, that community can help one another, right? Now we already do that in a lot of ways. So it's not like we're not doing it already, but this is just making it more prevalent, more easier to do. Like we're creating pathways that then can be exercised more in the days ahead. So that's the idea of things. And in fact, if we really see this for what it could become, it could actually end up supporting a lot of the other areas that may face difficulty or collapse. Like today, how do we fund our medical community and establishment? It is a crazy uh, set of financial dynamics in the medical industry. Like it's so expensive for everything. Everything's getting funneled through insurances and so forth. So, the, you know, the, I think God loves doctors and medicine and technology like that. But if it's just out of hand in the way that it's financed today, and then that'll just get exacerbated in any kind of crisis, they're going to need answers too for how do we do this? How do we do this different if like the insurance companies can't pay us anymore? So you start to think about like we could start taking more of a leadership role in these areas if other things stop functioning as we as they normally do if we have trouble ahead. Hey, Greg, um, you know, whenever there's an alternate currency, um, if it's not widely recognized, then the uh, consumer options of what it will buy become limited. I'll give an example. Um, in the Eastern Kentucky coal mines and throughout a lot of the coal fields, uh, the miners were paid in, in something called scrip. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but... Um, some people actually collect the old coins uh, that, and, so, and a lot of them have a hole in the middle of them. I don't know why they did that, but so you got it was it was denominated in dollars, but it it was not a dollar. I think it could be converted into a dollar at a discount, uh, maybe eighty five cents in dollars for a dollar in script, but it could only be spent in the mining camps, they had these uh, company stores or or they call them commissaries. And they had, it was like a big general store. They had pretty much everything you wanted, groceries, clothes, all kinds of stuff. But that was the only place you could spend your script. Yep. So um, 
kind of like all prison all money. What's that? It's kind of like prison money. You can only spend it in the prison. You got it. And um, so, you know, um, anything that would make something a currency has to have wide acceptance. So pretty much today, you know, the new currency is Visa, MasterCard, Discover. People are, are doing more and more. We went to uh, Scandinavia uh, and we went to Sweden. Sweden is pretty much cashless. Uh, they just don't use cash. Everything's still denominated in their local currency, but they don't have physical cash. Um, so the big question is that of liquidity and acceptability. You know, despite the uh, debasement that's going on with the U.S. dollar, uh, the fact that it's still used in oil transactions around the world and lots of venues, you know, I, I don't know what's going to, I don't think it's going to go away. People say, oh, it's going to be replaced by this or that. I'm not sure it will be. But, uh, you know, I, I share your concerns about the potential for inflation. I mean, I lived through one of the most inflationary times in human history in this business in, in, the, in the early 80s. Uh, and, uh, you know, interest rates were extremely high. So I don't know what the answer is. I, I, you know, you, currency is a store of value. It's that simple. We can't do everything by barter. Uh, you know, we have to have certain things that money will buy. It's interesting uh, as you approach this problem. I think it's a huge problem what you're describing I'm not entirely certain what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great, this is a great discussion and point you're making, Tom. Um, Sweden is cashless today. More cult, more of our countries are going to become cashless. China's even crazier cashless because you have to do everything through their social media apps to purchase things like WeChat and so forth, which is even more right. Nice. And I think your point about today the currency, Chris is going to give you the floor in a second. Today the currency is Visa MasterCard Discovery Network. Uh, we have a fellow in our Christian relationships who runs Epic Pay, and he cre he basically has created a payment uh, system that's like Stripe or uh, like uh, Square, um, but it, 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 it's another alternative to tap into that network. So I think the idea of what we're going to get into, maybe this is what Chris wants to talk about, is creating a bridge that gets into those networks and you have convertibility, but and that that convertibility has to be backed by real assets with some degree of liquidity. But the idea would be to try to do, accomplish both things, where you can not only have your script or your Berkshires, but they are convertibly convertible technologically into dollars and that that that's a bridge and if the dollar is transitional so you said it's probably not going to go away right so it could be transitional well, that gives you your transition and if it really gets debased you could basically just cut off those bridges at some point if if it's no longer of value um, but the idea is you're trying to protect yourself against the contagion the inflation that's why those bridges are, uh, you know, you can cut them off if you need be. You to create something that's separate from it, but bridgeable to it. Chris, did you want to uh, interject? Oh, sure. Good morning. <clears throat> um, I, I mean, I, uh, the conversation's great this morning. The the part that I just wanted to. Um, highlight for us because I think it matters when I'm whenever I'm looking to dialogue discussions um, around macro or what I call generational solution because this is something that's just not a challenge or an issue or a near-term crisis this has been ongoing 
Tom just spoke a moment ago of his experience in the 80s. So these are both cyclical and generational in perspective, at least how I think of it. The other part that I think is important to keep in mind as we're thinking about solutions is that there, there has to be, um, in order for it to be make sense, um, the way I, at least I approach it is how this question is raised along with the applied approach to help people on board to possible next steps or solution is directly attributed to where is their starting point? So just so that all the conversation, maybe at least for me, it doesn't get jumbled. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas, but it, it, as we said at the top of the call, it looked a lot different if you live in inner city Chicago and you basically are earning dollars a year or you're somebody who isn't Bill and Melinda Gates, or maybe it's just Bill or Melinda these days. Sorry, is that too soon? <laughs> okay. So the question becomes, why are you guys laughing? Anyway, so the point is, if we're looking at this, if you're earning 200, 300, 500,000 a year, your approach to the same question obviously is very different. It's an obvious way of stating it, but I think it's material because the, the way I've been envisioning this is there are in a Venn diagram, if you use that analogy just visually for yourself, um, it's been very helpful for me to look at three larger things of economic um, spectrum. And part of the challenge in doing this requires um, alignment within each of those spheres, then gaining agreement within those sectors or those spheres next to you. So like, let's just say lower, middle and upper class to make it simple. And you start building the links between those groups based on the same premise, the same purpose, the same priorities. And that's where you start to get some level of like flywheel critical mass and movement. Because otherwise, these conversations like this are just gonna spin and we won't kind of see where they're going. That's why I'm excited for what we do in June and maybe get a chance to hit a whiteboard and discuss this because there's places where we get traction at different levels and then find the more quick, appropriate, you know, cookies on the lower shelf idea of where they start to connect, but also how they start to create um, an conversation within those earlier first adopters. So I'll pause there for a moment, but I just, I think it's gonna be helpful at some point in after our meeting in June, even for these ongoing dialogues the second half of the year to build, is that we, we wanna present to ourselves here a, a simple working framework so that these ideas start attaching, connecting, and converging where appropriate so it's less and less out of the theoretical because there are some very simple applied ways where we can do some things. Um, but it, it also means that everyone is going to be starting in a slightly different place. But from maybe our perspective here on the call, we also need a sense on when we talk to each different group or segment, we're giving them the best means forward appropriate for where they are, not just giving them conceptual frameworks, because that may not really be helpful. So that's the only observation I have over the last couple of months with moving forward with this, is that I think there's some, um, some of the more practical things that we do. Uh, the conceptual framework's good, but I think it's both and. We, we want to share with people what it looks like, but we also want to start giving people concepts that are more tangible to see how does it look different if you're in a lower middle or upper class community or because they each need each other but they're all going to have different um, opportunities and they're also going to have different ways of effectuating that vision from the get-go so i'll pause there
Yeah, this is this is a great uh, thing you're getting at, which is like you can talk about this all day long, and this has been our constant um, tension that's existed in in this group is like, well, Greg, that's all great, but who's doing it? Well, the point is people are starting to implement this. So do not imagine that this is all theory. Um, for example, and Joel's on the call, we've started this New England um, uh, Center for the Abolition of Poverty type storehouse group, and we're already gaining traction. And the very thing that Chris mentioned God has naturally brought together the different generations, but also the different classes. Some people are in need of assistance and help with loans. And some people are in a position where they can take money off the table in the markets and fund some of these initiatives. And some are in between who can do both. I want to put a little bit into the fund and I'm also have this opportunity to deploy capital over here. So this is happening. It's real. Um, there have been commitments made. We're interviewing people now in terms of how to disperse these monies in terms of loans. These are uh, non-recourse, no interest type loans, but on the other end, it's the person's responsibility to repay it and have a full plan in order to do that. So it's, it's the asymmetry that's not really in our current system of, hey, before God, I as the borrower have an obligation relationally to the lender. I, as the lender, have an obligation before God to show mercy, and if I don't get repaid, I have to be okay with that. So that's asymmetrical. That's a little bit different than a contract. That's happening now. You've got what's going on in JAMA, which is happening now, creating Mission Grove and creating value out of that and creating a pool of assets that piggybacks on the Mission Grove project that can turn into the storehouse idea. And then you've got this already going on that's been prototyped for years in Bradenton with Gary, where they've created many opportunities more on a one-off basis. But again, proof of concept, it's real. And so now it's like, okay, we all have some things that we've done, implemented. What are the lessons we're learning? And then how can we make that um, so that other people can adopt the practices we're starting to enter into? And that's, how I think, the way forward here is that it's not just happy talk. It's like, no, it's faith in action. We're actually doing this and it helps evangelism. It helps uh, people who are, who are in need of help and of assistance who, are, um, who want to get out of debt in the way the world works and so forth. So I think this is, this is the way forward. It's totally possible. We just have to believe and we have to put one foot in front of the other to try it. Uh, Dave Warren, you want to chime in with any comment? Because I spent some time with Dave in Michigan explaining some of these ideas to their local group there. And, you know, I think there was some reaction. There's kind of this blend always of skepticism and reaction and maybe what might it look like? Dave, I don't know if you want to share anything of either concerns or steps taken or anything from, from your group there in South Bend area. Right. Um, so, Greg, you're not even aware of this, but we did have a follow-up meeting to your Zoom call with all of us. And, uh, you know, it's all walking it out <clears throat> on my part, being patient to walk it out, answer questions, um, try to help people wrap their minds around this because um, it's just so foreign to how the people I'm connected to think, although they do believe that we need more of a community light, a community model, a community um, that's functioning closer to the book of Acts, these kinds of things. But anyway, we're taking the next step, which is going to obviously be to gather up again. And it will be at this coming meeting where we actually say, yeah, we're going to start to do a storehouse strategy, a storehouse fund, a, a, a more of a community based model. And I'm hopeful that we're going to um, uh, see that that practical next step happen. It's just um, it, anyway, for a variety of reasons, 
Um, it's just a slower process than what I would prefer, but I will say this, it's a, it's a good process. And, um, and if I can just uh, ask this, because it's been on my mind anyway, um, uh, Chris, um, we might need another voice in addition to Greg's voice to speak into, you know, just practically moving forward and um, just, you know, kind of being complimentary to what Greg's told us already. But would you be available at some point to jump on on a Zoom call, maybe for an, an hour or hour and a half? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I love to chat. You just have to, Greg will tell you, you just have to take everything I say with a grain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that. I'm, I'm a little out there on the, I'm a little out there too on the, on the envelope side. So that, that's fine. And we we're we're comfortable as a group because Greg's pushed us, pushed the envelope or trying to just totally upset the apple cart of our lives because we're so we're so comfortable in Babylon if I can put it that way we are comfortable slaves in Babylon and so Greg is already tipped over the apple cart you're not going to do anything more disruptive uh, but I, I feel like it's a mature group that can weigh and discern any, anything and everything but the, the, my point is is that I think the group wants to say okay another voice that says this is possible or has a working model, I think that's where you could jump in, Chris, and be helpful. Well, in, uh, since Greg turned over the apple cart, I'll just tell your group that we'll get together and talk about uh, picking them up and making applesauce. Perfect. So, it's the anyway, tag that's team. Where, uh, it's the fellas, I'm going to say goodbye at this point. So nice listening to all of you. See you, Dad. Love you. Yep. So, so anyway, I love the, the practical aspect that we're uh, talking about here, and and we're right in the middle of that. And uh, it's sort of for us as a local community, it's we're at that make or break point. So anyway, hopefully, I'm hoping that in June I have um, more more to share. Maybe a quick footnote I would say is um, before um, Dave, are you thinking you'll be able to join in June? You know, it's, it's tough. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I got some tough things that I have to still evaluate, but anyway, I, I'm up in the air. Sure. Come on, Dave, you can do it. Take the practical sure. implementation step. You know, I, most people are like, you know, uh, peer pressure is not a good thing. I don't respond to that. And actually, <laughs> peer pressure is actually really effective with me. Excellent. <laughs> I'll keep working that angle. Um, you should co-opt someone else in your group there to come with you. And then, then you guys will have company and fun together. That's a good point. Hmm. So what I was going to suggest is it, if you're in, in either instance, if you, if you were able to join or, or not either way, it'd be good to schedule at least a call, uh, maybe a couple calls, um, between now and then, largely because there's um, what would be helpful to know before we meet with the group, um, your group in particular, is to get a, a sense of assessment, like I was saying earlier, of where where the group and community is. Because what I'm what I'm trying to do is just what I said a moment ago. Um, I'd rather have a more clear context of where some of the boundaries, priorities, and focus lie within each community so that the appropriate, whatever that means, whatever those best ideas, solutions, possibilities, opportunities could be, <clears throat> are actually more in alignment with what, what the community you're with needs. And so praying through that and thinking through what those ideas or possibilities are would be a good next step for us to do over you know these coming few weeks um, just so you can help me understand and, and get up to speed with what's going on too so if we did that over a couple calls that would be really helpful for me and then i'd better know how to uh, consider and and you know pray with you about what some of the possibilities could look like at least mm -hmm. we come to a, a more um 
a better starting point. And, and I'd rather do that before we meet with the group. And that might be something that you and another friend, like the three of us could do on a call. And it doesn't have to be that long, but at least work through a few of those details to help me get up to speed and with Greg too, so that we can, you know, just serve best and, and come with a better, a better starting point. Well, I, I just want to say that that would be excellent and that I already can think of the key points of discussion that you and I would need to have for you to be prepared. Um, and I think we can really bring some good focus and make it much more uh, fruitful and effective. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. Some more uh, peer pressure for you, Dave. In all honesty, it really would be encouraging to hear a group from testimony from a group that's just embryonic in this, like we were skeptical, we're trying, we're experimenting. I think that's as valuable uh, for others that, uh, than anything else, because it's so hard to cross over that imaginary barrier to try to do something. Um, I'd also encourage your group, like, and maybe we've already said this or talked about it, take that step by faith of like saying, okay, we're going to start this thing you know, if anyone wants to contribute even a small amount to it, please do. And then what we found here in New England with our group is there was a super hunger and desire to step into that. And even though the dollar amounts aren't big, the, it's pretty, it's getting broader in terms of the participation rate. And I had a guy the other day who was like intrigued by this. The Lord had already been speaking to him for years behind the scenes. Um, and he didn't quite understand it. Like at one point he felt like, you know, he and a ministry partner were thinking that, that God was telling them to start a bank and they didn't understand it. Like, why would we start a bank? And then when I started explaining this stuff to him, he's like, oh yeah, I get it. Like I'm in just, here's, here's a check. Like there wasn't even like a further discussion about it. So it was amazing. Like watching people respond. Something to add to, right, is, um, you know, there's ways, not there's ways, you know, a little leaven leavens, a little yeast leavens the whole batch, right? And so if, if people are having difficulty engaging with this on like a grand scale, right, like how do I kingdomly use my retirement fund, right, there's that notion of like, how do you kingdomly use the like $80 that's in your pocket, right? And like starting small, um, building like kingdom response to financial situations that aren't your financial situation um, and letting that grow into these bigger things. You know, sometimes there's like a conversion that is like rapid. Oh, like this person needs $300 to like, do a dinner so they can make some money but like they like don't have you know they they also need the 300 dollars, right like so what does it mean to sponsor somebody and like just like be accepting of there's going to be no return what does it mean to spend you know 300 dollars in a way that like doesn't profit you um but profits somebody else um and getting in those habits and in those routines such that when you're looking at your you know, your larger portfolio, um, it's actually a lot easier to let go of things in a way that glorifies God. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think about that in like, like this context. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lady at our church who, you know, is always borrowing money from people, right, and rarely paying it back. And like, you have to ask those questions of like, is this sustainable? Like, is this like, like hurting our community is this helping our community um but you know what you see out of this one individual whose situation um is very slowly changing right from homelessness to like having a stable living situation to uh, um like like being secure but still dependent on other people um you know, you see these gradual growths over years, right? This is like years of transformation for a person. Um, but what you also see in the community around it and taking care of one person, you know, $20 at a time, um, you see people that 
know how to invite people into their homes differently. You see people that are more willing to give when they know that like, they know they're not gonna get it back. Um, and so, yeah, I think even just looking at those very small, like $20, $80, like how do I use the money that's in my pocket? Um, yeah, I think that's how we end up going from you know, Sons of Thunder, who, you know, they just went out into their hometowns, uh, you know, preached the gospel, you know, the demons responded, you know, to the command in the name of Jesus, they're mesmerized, and then the next city, right, they reject Jesus, and these two guys who are all hyped up and mad, they actually believe that if Jesus told them that they could rain down fire from heaven in his name, that it would work. Right. So they had this like tremendous faith that like grew in their hometowns in this like small application. And then they go on to be these like, you know, the apostles of the, of the faith. Um, so, yeah, I think there's just like some really humble beginnings that don't have to start with like um, like a lofty self-righteousness with our 401ks. Um, it can it can actually start like very small. Um, and I think that's how. I mean, that, that is how Jesus described the kingdom as something that starts as small as the mustard seed and grows as large as a, a mustard plant. I'll just, I'll just say quickly to, to Joel's point, more of what I've been doing, and this might be helpful, Dave, for our next conversation with your, your friends and community there. But part of the word that I've been, the message I've been sharing and connecting to this also ties back, at least for me, to Matthew 25, uh, 40 specifically, where Jesus talks about what you do unto the least of these, your brothers and sisters, you do unto me. So to Joel's point of, you know, whatever that money is in your pocket and how to use it or how do you show uh, that compassion or God's unconditional love in those moments, uh, I guess it doesn't matter if it's two mites or two bucks or 20 bucks. It's, it always comes back down to not the amount, but the posture of our heart. We know that we say it, but that's really it. There's not more to the story. That's literally what God is after is what's the posture of your heart. Right. And if I you had $2,000 of money you could give great, but it's, really after our heart in the midst of all of this that's the part that i think is the transformation and the change that greg's also been really stirring and encouraging us in for so you know for many years and i think that's why that's why this isn't just possible this is something that god i pray will cause us not invite us not challenge us but literally cause his people to do because it's through that kind of witness and testimony that people are going to look and say, oh, those are his real followers. Those are the people of the way kind of a thing. And that's really at the heart and the spirit behind Storehouse, as I understand it, because it's really just about kingdom life mm -hmm. and living and how we're trying to translate that in more tangible, simple ways in, in the midst of where we are. So I, I think, Joel, I just want to say thank you because that was good. Yeah, amen. Yeah, really good. And what Dave knows, because I've, I've spoken to his group about this, is we, we also have to guard our hearts against the argument of, well, I already do that, Chris. You know, I give to the poor and I give my tithe and I give my offering. But what we're trying to get people to understand is like all of what we have belongs to God. And even though the American value is I'm independent, I do my own thing, um, we have to unlock the investment side of our house. We have to say like, it's not just charitable only and that's church and then my money, my retirement, my future, my planning, my career, my income, that's mine. And I don't talk about it. I don't like to talk about it. We've got to start tapping into that side and not create artificial silos or lines and say, Hey God, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. It's like Gary Crawford has said, and I totally identify with this. 
God told me, why are you worried about your 401k? Because when, by the time you want to use it, it may not be there. And so he, that was an aha moment for him. So it's like, when we really see what Chris is saying, it's like turning it around rather than like, oh, I'm trying to convince you to do this because it's good. It's like, well, the Lord is saying, do this, or it's going to be, you're on sand and it's going to be trouble in the, in the days ahead. So it's really wisdom um, that we're talking about here as much as anything else. And it's like, enter into that heavenly wisdom and God will make a way. Try it. Um, God loves when we try something, as Joel's talking about, like just a little bit, like God says, here, come, you know, taste and see, try this out take one step in front of the other. Um, I don't even know if I would have uh, gone through the journey I would have if I had known what was in the road ahead. It was almost like, oh, well, I could go that way and then I could go that way and then I could go that way and then before I knew it, I'm down the path. So I think there's something to that for sure in faith is like, hey, let's just challenge ourselves to uh, to get on board and, and, and follow the Lord's leading and I do think that this principle shifts from first they that God fishes after us, then he hunts after us. So first God, in his kindness, leads us to repentance. And then if that doesn't work, there are other steps that are harder, but they're still for our good. It's just that the kindness didn't move us uh, in the right direction. So, yeah, I think these things are true. Um, anything else before we, uh, wrap up? I think the conversation has been great. We've talked about what this thing looks like practically. I think a lot of the questions that were asked today are big questions that do need to be addressed. So I'm so glad that Tom and others asked those questions because they're the right questions, um, that give people more of an assurance that this is just is not just uh, playtime imaginary, you know, Christian Christianese. This is real, and God is saying, you know, enter into this. And what we even didn't get into today, which Chris and I have been talking about a little bit, and Dave and I, is the whole aspect of like, well, what if we are in the time and the season of Revelation seventeen and eighteen? Because that is an even bigger reason to move out of Babylon and enter into what God is saying. Because if we don't, it, the timeline could quickly swallow us up where we're entering into things that we didn't expect maybe for a long, long time are all of a sudden like right at our doorstep. And how are we gonna respond to that? How are we gonna respond to um, if, if, if the time frame of the Lord's return is, is faster than we might've imagined, like, we don't want to be like the sleeping virgins who are caught unawares or weren't prepared or weren't like trimming their lamps, weren't gathering the extra oil. We don't want to be there. We want to be prepared. So great discussion. Anybody want to say anything else or close us in prayer? I can close us if we're ready. Okay. Lord, just really grateful for your uh, kingdom principles and what we're talking about here, Lord, and taking those principles and real life application, real life difference, real community, God, and, and Lord, uh, moving out of our siloed situations into community, God, I pray, Father, that you would continue to burn this in our hearts, that this is your now message. There's, there's a special message in this for us. Um, in our day now, but it's always been a key message. And somehow in the last generation or two or three, we've really moved away from it in this country, Lord, in terms of your purposes and your uh, communal approach, God. And I pray, Father, that we can uh, have insight from heaven, that we can move forward. I want to pray for my specific local group here, as well as others here that are working with their groups. Lord, I pray that we'd see this move forward forward and um and really be able to navigate the, the bumps in the road and, and not not see the enemy get in but see us grow and have greater faith and more wisdom in terms of how to navigate a, a storehouse community and 
Um, God, strengthen us, Lord. And um, Lord, I pray that as we go here that uh, you'd be putting this on our hearts so that we would um, be able to take these practical steps forward here that we just talked about. Um, so, Lord, we commit our day to you, this week to you, and we, uh, again, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Have a great Take rest care. of the week. Talk soon.